Okay, welcome everybody and good afternoon, good morning or good evening, depending on where you're listening in from. Um, I'm Nick Boucher and I'm a fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this online discussion on the changing faces of civil society and civic, the civic landscape in the Eastern Partnership countries. This is a discussion to mark the publication of two new papers that we have just published this morning at the, on, they are now available on the GMF website and I will share in the link uh, in the chat function the links to them as well. These are two papers looking both at uh, new civic actors in the Eastern Partnership and also about into societal attitudes to civil society and to civic space and civic engagement in the region. We have a great uh, lineup of speakers to discuss these issues today. Um, I will start by saying that this, these two papers are the result of a research project that we conducted at GMF and with a very generous and kind support from both the EU's DGNEA and USAID's uh, Europe and Eurasia Bureau. Um, which I just want to take this opportunity to thank them again for this support. Um, we will begin today by having two interventions, first from Margot Ellis, who is the Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Bureau for Europe and Eurasia at USAID, and then from Lawrence Meredith, who is the Director for Neighborhood East and Institution Building in DG Near. And then I will hand over to, first of all, my former colleague and co-conspirator um, co in this pro project, Rosa Balfour, who was at GMF and is now the Director of Carnegie Europe. Then to my co-author on one of the papers, uh, Katarina Peshikova from a campus university. And once we have, we, Katarina and Rosa have spoken a little bit about the two papers respectively, I will then ask uh, three of our collaborators on this project from the Eastern Partnership to jump in with some of their comments. Uh, first of all, Yuri Chavusov from uh, Belarus, uh, Isabella Sarsian, who's joining us from Yerevan in Armenia and uh, Katarina Zaremba, who's joining us from Kiev. Um, if you would like to intervene afterwards in the Q&A, or if you have any comments or anything to make, please use the Q&A function in Zoom to either, but please make sure to identify yourself clearly so I can actually know a little bit more about who's uh, intervening. And I will either pass on your comment or questions myself, or we will see if we can actually make you intervene uh, live. On that note, I'm very happy to hand over, first of all, to Margot to give us some of our, of our comments. Thank you very much, Nick. And I want to thank GMF for hosting this event, but also for the extensive research that went into producing the two reports that we'll be discussing today. And of course, to our partner in crime, Lawrence Meredith, engineer. We've had a lot of crowd collaboration. Uh, we, we had a, a video call last, only last Tuesday, I believe it was. Uh, so for both to helping to conceptualize the research that was undertaken, as well as for co-funding. I think it's important uh, after this discussion that these papers and what's gonna be discussed will in help inform our civil society development programming moving forward. So I did have the opportunity to read the two papers and I appreciate them. And I wanted to offer some preliminary comments and I know when we'll turn it over to, to the experts. Uh, first, I'll speak about the, the first paper, The Changing Landscape of Civil Society in Eastern Europe. I think we you at USA, but also more broadly, we often see a disconnect before, between the formalized civil society sector and the grassroots civil society with formalized civil society uh, being a bit vilified these days uh, and, and criticized for being elitist or detached from reality. I and mean, I've, I've, we've heard the term grant eaters uh, in the region. Um, also, some you know their traditional role has shifted. Um, a lot uh, earlier, their their principal role as a watchdog on government is waning, or the extent of political or the principal role as uh, an organ for political activism is also being called into into question. Uh, I think we have we tend to too easily discount the engagement that's happening at the grassroots community levels. And you know, when we think of our own lives, we, this type of activism um, is all around us and we have to recognize it. Whether we're talking about 
as a parent, participating in a parent-teacher conference, uh, local uh, planning meeting, uh, participating in a housing in your housing if you live in a cooperative, living uh, participating in those meetings, uh, uh, participating in a food or, or clothing drive for the homeless. And with regard to COVID-19, um, some of the groups that have uh, spawned in to respond to the most vulnerable groups. And I think we have to recognize that whether we're talking about these formalized civil society organiza organizations or these more local levels of engagement, there's room for both. And they're, uh, and they're both valued in terms of con contributions to a flourishing democracy. Not only is the work at this local level having a difference and an impact on the communities in which they work, but they really are contributing to developing individuals that participate. And they impart important practical skills that can be scaled up, whether we're talking about organizing a meeting, budget planning, volunteer recruitment, priority setting. And these can be, as I said, scaled up to uh, for greater and, and broader efforts to achieve development outcomes. I think both Lawrence and I have spent a lot of time recently uh, on Belarus. So I'll use uh, that as an example. You know, what we we invested over the last few years and spent a lot of time on uh, trying to cultivate some of this grassroots activism. And in part, it was um, circumscribed for us because of the challenging closing space for civil society in, in Belarus. So most of the groups that we had supported or encouraged were very much focused on community level issues. And in the past, some might have supported it, uh, might have um, implied or commented that these efforts were small scale and not that important. But I'm sure now no one will question how important that some of these, that keeping civil society alive, even through these very small scale efforts were necessary and, and help galvanize the national level engagement that we're seeing today in Belarus. So I think in terms of moving forward, um, we recognize this space for, for some formalized civil society as well as these informal groups, and we should not try to merge the two, but to create opportunities for both to coexist and support each other. I'm turning to the second paper from Apathy to Action and Civic Engagement in the Eastern Partnership, I thought it, the word apathy was particularly provocative, interesting, and I have heard apathy used often to characterize uh, the citizenry of Eastern Partnership in Eastern Europe. But maybe, you know, perhaps we as donors, um, maybe we're mischaracterizing the nature of the citizenry. Um, and clearly, if we look across the six countries in the Eastern Partnership, I don't think anyone participating here today would say that the citizenry is apathetic. I think what we have to do is kind of shed our, our Western vocabulary and recognize that participants in civil society might not frame uh, issues and efforts the way that we would, or use a, the same vocabulary. But that doesn't mean that they're not talking about issues that are important to them and taking act, meaningful action for them. So while terms like democracy building or transparency might not be part of the common parlance among civil society, um, or as broadly spoken of as, as previously, clearly, the idea of community activism and preservation of dignity, helping your neighbor clearly resonate and are helping citizens across the Eastern Partnership uh, mobilize in creative ways. I think from the re uh, recommendations of the paper, we agree with them uh, in terms of the importance of continuing to invest in civil literacy and stressing the importance of social responsibility, encouraging civic uh, engagement campaigns. Um, and one more time to turn to Belarus. Clearly, if you know, we're 60 days uh, into since uh, August 9th, um, illegitimate election. And, uh, you know, when we look there, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people who have come out to protest, I don't think 
that you know we could say that they the citizens tree are clearly what is not apathetic but in terms of the vocabulary they use they might not say that they're on the streets to protect their fundamental freedoms of, or association or freedom of speech or assembly but they might uh, frame it in terms of trying to take matters into their own to have to basically to try to um, um, have exercise the right to uh, have a say in their own government and have and they're probably tired of having decisions made for them. So clearly, <clears throat> the citizens of Belarus have are not apathetic. So in conclusion, I think it's safe to say that civil society is alive in the Eastern Partnership countries and it's continuing to evolve and we as donors need to also evolve and adapt with them so i look forward to the briefing and the discussion to follow thank you thank you very much margo um on that point i hand over to you lawrence thank you very much uh, great pleasure to be here and to join with you um and and margo and as margo has already very eloquently said uh, i mean i think the european union and the us are um uh, are really bringing their cooperation to unprecedented levels in terms of working on civil society in the Eastern Partnership. And I think that's because we both really value the role of civil society in the Eastern Partnership. So we're very grateful to GMF for hosting this event and these two extremely thought provoking papers uh, and to have the opportunity to join a debate. And I can see from the chat that the debate is already uh, comfortably up and running and I'm looking forward to the question and answers part. Um, before we get to that, let me start by saying how important civil society really is um, uh, to the European Union's relationship with the Eastern Partnership countries. Uh, to give you one example, um, with my fellow director Luke de Vigne, we hosted uh, all the member states and all the pun uh, partner countries at senior official level this morning to discuss the future of the Eastern Partnership uh, after Luke and I had set out how the institutions view it. And before going to either partner countries or member states, we called on the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum, precisely because we think it's good that um, uh, to hear from the institutions, but it's good to get an immediate um, alternative vision. And we, we uh, civil societies are both a partner, but also there to challenge uh, the countries challenge the member states and challenge us on on what's the 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 best way forward and i think that's essential um you know covid19 is a global challenge of the likes i think none of us have seen before it's simply radically changing how uh, human behavior um it's devastating effects on the economies and how people interact and i think um you know, the motto of the Eastern Partnership is stronger together. And that means that we need to uh, pool our ideas and pool our resources and, and bring together our different roles in this, um, in, in responding to this pandemic. And I mean, I really do see, uh, I'd like to give three examples of how we see just in contemporary um, world, um, civil society being key to reinforcing resilience, which is going to be the theme of the future of the Eastern Partnership. Um, uh, let me start in Belarus as Margot did, because it's totally unprecedented, this civic mobilization for, for, for two months. And um, we are responding. I was at the Foreign Affairs Council with uh, uh, High Representative Burrell and um, uh, Commissioner Opelein was there yesterday um, to confirm that we are stepping up our so support to empower local civil society organizations, to help with uh, independent media, to support youth. And we uh, see very much that um, the, the future is um, a much stronger engagement with civil society. It's very difficult times now, but that shows how powerful and engaged civil society is. Anything other than apathetic, or rather an inspiration. Um, and indeed, uh, I understand the European Parliament has already listed um, the um, Belarus and civil society in opposition as one of the candidates for the Zakharov Prize. Um, uh, I think that was decided uh, uh, either yesterday or this morning. Uh, secondly, as we see the um, tragic resumption of hostilities in uh, over Nagorno-Karabakh, um, we welcome on the side of the European Union uh, the statement of the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum 
calling uh, for an immediate cessation of hostilities and a resumption of meaningful negotiations. Um, we felt already in our senior officials meeting uh, this morning, understandably the tension surrounding this, um, and we have, but we did have representatives at senior level from both Armenia and Azerbaijan around the virtual table. I think that's um, in a, mild, uh, a modest way encouraging, uh, but clearly civil society is a voice calling um, for a for peaceful solution to this um, situation. And thirdly, I think um, coming back to COVID, uh, civil society has a crucial role to play in all sorts of different levels. Um, in terms of working with vulnerable groups, um, in terms of also watchdog and advocacy activities, because there are challenges to governance. Um, there is a temptation to take shortcuts. Um, in, uh, you know, a lot of countries have emergency measures in place, but that's not an excuse for um, a disempowerment, quite the opposite, and also to counter disinformation. So. Um, be it Belarus, be it the conflict or be it response to COVID, we see very much a role for civil society. And um, at the risk of slightly um, overrunning, and I'll try to be concise, uh, Nicholas, um, I'd like to make five um, short points about what we on the side of the European Union are doing to put in place a more strategic approach to, to uh, engaging with civil society, and which we hope will address some of the points that are flagged in your paper. Firstly, um, we believe that, that one of the great strengths of civil society is its grassroots. And one of the challenges for a major international organization, and we would argue for, for national governments themselves, is to get outside capital cities where prosperity levels are often five to 10 times higher even before COVID. And I fear that the disparity may be accentuated by COVID. So the outreach to people on the ground, civil society has an unparalleled position. Secondly, we've learned to be more strategic and indeed the German Marshall Fund is one of our strategic partners um, that we've put in place because that allows us, um, whereas it's hard for a big international organization to reach the smaller actors in civil society, if we have, a, let's say, a strong and credible partner like German Marshall Fund, and there are some others, um, you can help us be more flexible, be faster, and to do some work with sub-granting and core funding in ways that we simply can't do as a massive international organization. So we're grateful for German Marshall Fund and to others who've become our strategic partners. Thirdly, um, we're stepping up our support to the European Endowment for Democracy, which was stepped up precisely for this reason to help us as a major new um, partner on the European landscape. And we believe it's a strong partnership um, that's coming to fruition and will be further strengthened as we look ahead. Fourthly, um, we're trying to make support more predictable and more impact driven. And that will be a, a key theme as we set out the ideas for the future of the Eastern Partnership that we want to build on. We've already got some measures in place, but I mean, today I'm, I'll be listening very carefully to how you think we can do that. Um, through our multi-annual civil society facility. And fifthly and finally, um, the social entrepreneurship, because as we respond to COVID, a lot said about build back better, but the better is in, as, as important as the build back. And I think civil society can really play a key role in making sure that it's not just build back, not just quick and dirty, but also actually better. So for all those reasons, one of the major uh, five priorities of the Eastern Partnership going forward will be building a more inclusive and resilient society. And we see civil society is absolutely crucial for that uh, in strengthening societal resilience and making sure that the European Union's action uh, is closer uh, to making a difference on the ground with the Eastern Partnership citizens. Forgive me if I was a minute or two long, but thank you very much indeed. And I look forward to the other contributions and to the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. That's much appreciated and excellent timekeeping. I'm glad also that we've managed already between the two of you to spark something of a conversation and some uh, differences of opinion, maybe. That's quite good between what we, some of what we've written, written perhaps. Um, to go into more details into both papers, I'll just now hand over to Rosa Balfour and then I will pass over to Katerina Peshikova, who will tell us a little bit more with what both papers actually contain. Thank you. Thank you so, very much, Nick. And uh, thank you for inviting me. It's nice to see 
uh, faces of people I haven't seen for some time. Uh, um, Katharina, it was, like, it was about a year ago that we met in Kiev, actually. Um, uh, so, right. I will try to um, focus on two main aspects of the paper. Um, just said to say, I think when we started off with this uh, research project, um, the um, we were just struck, and I think there was a demand also on part of the EU and the US as donors between the concepts that we had been carrying with us since the beginning, at least since the beginning of uh, transition in the 1990s, the, the concepts actually are much older about civil society and its role in, in democratic transition and, and the sort of fluid, fluidity of the landscape and how hard it was to pin it down. And I think through the research which was carried out, uh, first and foremost by six researchers in the individual um, countries and then followed up by us, um, including extensive interviews with a wide range of civil society activists of different stripes and color. And I'd actually like to thank them here for the time they dedicated uh, to me on my field uh, trips. We found that it was very hard to, you know, pin down what's happening in civil society because indeed it is fluid, but in that fluidity, there were lots of interesting aspects that we felt needed to come have a voice, bring, we felt that we needed to um, give them a reality. So I think um, uh, the um, first thing, and some of these things have already been said, is that um, a broader range of issues was cl were clearly um, cared for by uh, civil society uh, groups. We've, we were, amongst us, we were calling them newer issues. They're not really new. I mean, uh, communities have always been worried about their own environment, the ecology, the ecosystem around them, but they suddenly have been, they had come to acquire a greater meaning. Uh, whereas perhaps in the 1990s, the focus was more on rule of law and human rights. Now, uh, there was a lot of mobilization around green issues with younger generations engaging on these topics, thinking about resources, thinking about social services, and of course, LGBTIQ rights, which is again features much more prominently than ever uh, before in these, you know, the topics that these groups are um, looking at, and also a stronger focus on communities on grassroots. Um, at the same time, on, on the grassroots level, at the same time, we're also seeing um, the um, empowerment or um, sort of bolder uh, conservative. Uh, civil society, which again didn't fit in the concept that we had been look that we had been using to understand civil society developments, very much tied to the church, to religious organisations, and also uh, a creeping emergence of far right group of groups, often violent, um, very uh, frequently enjoying impunity, um, and therefore with you know rule of law not really um, um, addressing. The, um, the role that these violent uh, far-right groups were having and the, the sort of conflict in societies. And then, of course, the gongos, we all know about gongos, um, and then this, this growing antipathy towards the Western-styled um, NGOs. So all this was actually happening um, in, in, in that landscape, and it's very diff difficult to put any of these organizations in, into boxes. Uh, some of them are networks, some of them are community-led initiatives, some of them are proper NGOs, some belong to international um, networks. So there's a huge variety. And I think the key point really is to keep the ear on the ground to understand how these um, organizations are moving um, and to understand how they're influential. Um, it's very hard, I think, for the donor community to distinguish, for instance, between gongos and uh, genuine um, um, NGOs. And of course, there's a lot of Gray, there's a gray area between them, um, but it's therefore it's all the more important not just to rely on transparency rules um, and the legal systems, which nonetheless need to be uh, looked at by donors, and that's one of the policy recommendations in the paper. But it's also very important to um, take into account local views, peer reviewing of the various um, new organisations. Um, one thing that we've always known, but of course came up in the, in, in the conversations we had in the countries, was that 
there is a gap between rural areas and, and national capitals in all of these um, countries. But in in uh, but there is activism in, in the rural of, in in the rural areas, um, and they work a lot with um, local governments and you know working, for instance, on um, topics which might may not be straightforwardly political. Uh, for instance, dis disability rights, but actually can be a, a, a backdoor for more political issues. I'm thinking of refugees for, for women and children and victims of violence, or for instance, campaigns against exploitation of natural resources. There were cases in, for instance, electricity power stations in Georgia, which mobilized both uh, civil society organizations in the localities, but also in the capital because they needed legal aid. So there's a, actually a lot happening. So even if the, the, there is a gap between capitals and rural areas in some countries more than others. Um, there are at the same time um, these um, these um, this, this type of activism. Um, so I think there are two points basically that I'd like to you know having done this sort of painted this very broad brush picture. Um, there are two points that I'd like to bring out. The first is the rise the rise of non political issues. Um, there's also quite a lot happening around education, culture, science, um, um, and but at the same time, the growing polarization in these societies, not dissimilar in terms of a uh, gap between, between, um, between fronts uh, to what we're seeing also in Western Europe, there's, there is a strong polarization which makes the political debate much harder. Um, the second thing I'd like to uh, refer to in summarizing uh, the paper is the relationship between this changing landscape and political change and, and politics. Um, the, um, the, the, as, as I mentioned, this mistrust towards the Western styled um, NGOs, there's, there's partly a generational uh, thing attached to it. Um, and that the older generation is seen as tied to the 1990s transition and it, it, the sort of failures of those transition or the unfulfilled promises of those of that transition is what is mobilizing a lot of the younger um, people. And of course, in some countries, that, uh, that um, avant-garde of civil society is, you know, is in prison or has gone into exile. So in some countries, uh, this has not worked out well for reasons of political um, for political repression. So what we've seen, however, with the most the latest um, instances of mobilization is that those local issues that we talked about earlier um, have actually fed into global, more global movements of, of political change. So I'm thinking Gezi Park is perhaps you know, a, a sort of younger 2013 in Turkey. But then, of course, in Armenia, the uh, Occupy Mashot Park, and then Gorky Park in Kharkiv in, in, um, in, um, in Ukraine. And they all seem to be, uh, if you look today at what's happening in Belarus, or if you look two years ago what was happening in Armenia, you can see that that grassroots level mobilization has fed into something uh, much, much broader and, and of you know, broader political significance. And I think when, uh, and we chose the photograph with the, for the cover of this paper, we chose the photograph with the Belarusian women dressed in white and red, um, you know, the, on the streets, they are unexpected. Um, and there is an unexpected, there is a mobilization of unexpected categories of society, um, which I think is really um, important. And I think it sort of vindicates some of the findings. Um, and of course, the role of social media is something that we um, also looked at. And uh, in this case, I'd like to, um, you know, telegraph in, in Belarus, um, Facebook uh, for, for organizing all the um, appointments in the streets. And we're seeing something which in terms of political change is perhaps much more tied to networking and to spontaneity, um, which I think in many, in many ways reflects the complexity, complexity of our societies. Um, it does, of course, um, on the downside, lead to um, a potentially uh, fragmented political opposition. And I think we're seeing signs of that also in Belarus um, at the moment. Um, uh, to conclude, I would like to just raise two broader questions that are less about civil society and more about um, political transition and about the policies that we should think about. Um, the 
the next step for this should really be to reflect on how these findings about fluid civil society, how it relates to understandings of transition um, and whether it challenges in any way the model that we have been working on of, of you know, transition, which has you know, political reform towards democracy and economic reform towards market um, economy. And I think, we ought, I think we ought to ask the question whether that transitional model is um, still working. Over the years, I mean, it's, it's 40 years old, it's been adjusted. And those of us who've been following EU policy have been looking at how and when these adjustments have been made. And of course, the way money is spent reflects very much those adjustments. But we're actually living in, in an environment where we are questioning that model ourselves. Um, in, you know, post-pandemic, uh, post-coronavirus pandemic, we are questioning ultra-liberalism and um, we are looking, there's you know, new debates on state aid, uh, new debates on a public deficit. Um, and, and I think we ought to question, wonder whether this will have any consequence in the ways in which we engage with other countries. So whether the, the sort of transition paradigm upon which we have built the whole um, uh, uh, setup of engaging with uh, Europe's neighbours to the east and in, and in the Western Balkans, whether perhaps, you know, whether perhaps we need some a bit more than an adjustment and just think through our policies a little bit more carefully. And the second broader question uh, that comes to my mind um, is that the, the protest movements that we've seen, that we're seeing now in, in Belarus and that we saw in, in um, Armenia in 2018 were refusing the logic of geopolitics. They, the protesters are going to the streets saying, we, and we don't want to you know, enter someone else's sphere of influence. We don't want to become anti-Russian. We want to participate. We want to have a say in our own, in our own, in how our livelihood is managed. So they're refusing the logic of geopolitics, which I think is really, um, perhaps this is the new thing that's happening in, in, um, in Eastern Europe. And the EU in particular is the natural partner. The EU was built to, um, to eliminate the logic of geopolitics and power politics. Um, however, if it wants to help these societies head in that direction, it needs to protect that space from geopolitics. And that's where I think we need a little bit more of a hard-nosed intervention. And protecting that space, that means protect, you know, protecting the work that the EU and the US are doing um, as donors, which is not of geopolitical intent, even if it is interpreted in that way um, in the Kremlin, as we all know. Um, but I think there still is a bit of a gap between what is uh, carried out by donors and then what is discussed at the table or on the phone calls with Moscow uh, when, um, the, um, when citizens of uh, the countries in the Eastern Partnership decide uh, that they're no longer satisfied with their authoritarian regimes. So, um, yeah, these are the broad points, as I said, broad, broad brush um summary of the paper i didn't go into the policy recommendations but I, I chose to sort of raise the bar a bit and encourage us to think a little bit more about bigger picture policies thank you very much rosa i think that was a very good uh, overview indeed of the paper and the bigger questions that come out of them um i'll just hand over now to katarina pshikova who is going to actually tell us more about the second paper katarina over to you thank you um thank you nick uh it was uh a wonderful project to be part of. Um, it was indeed a pleasure and an inspiration. So I would like to thank everyone involved. It was wonderful, a wonderful experience. And as Nick already mentioned, the two papers are indeed um, complementary. And so whereas the, what Rosa has talked about, has presented um, is more written from a more kind of agency perspective and is looking at the variety of civic actors and shows how sophisticated civic landscapes indeed have become in these countries. Our paper um, shifts uh, its gaze to more structural factors and more specifically to societal attitudes. And so uh, rather than looking at civic activists, we um, look at active citizenship in more general sense, more as a characteristic of the society as a whole. And we try to ask how a society can be 
uh, more engaged and indeed more resilient because that is one of the uh, ways of uh, forging greater resilience. And this of course plays very differently across um, the six uh, Eastern partnership countries. But our general argument here is that one of the things that really matters for creating more engaged societies is the quality of linkages between the civic activists and the rest of the society. And so we try to unpack this a little bit and see uh, what, what, what is the diagnosis across the six uh, Eastern partnership countries and what are the ways forward in this direction um, by looking at two sets of societal attitudes. Um, and the first one is about the attitudes towards civil society organizations and civic activists. Um, and the second one is more about um, the attitudes or rather ideas about civic engagement on a personal level. So uh, with respect to the attitudes towards civil society organizations and civic activists, we um, really try to be uh, very detailed here and we try to um, explore how visible civil society organizations are, what is their public image, are they seen in a positive or in a negative light, how much they are trusted, how, what, what's exactly expected of them, what kind of um, initiatives, what kind of activities, what's uh, seen as their main contribution, how much what they're doing is valued to the extent that people would act actually choose to contribute something, anything, volunteer, donate. And uh, what we find is on the one hand, um, it seems to us that um, it seems uh, across all uh, six citizenship countries that um, if we uh, try to uh, measure the membership in civil society organizations, which is actually quite a difficult thing to measure, um, it still uh, seems to be pretty weak. So then we try to also unpack that a little bit and look at other forms of engagement with civil society organizations or civic activists. You know, if people actually know about those activities, if people try to join them, have ever followed them, have tried to volunteer anything, something on any level, be that the grassroots level or um, kind of more general nationwide petitions kind of level. Um, and but still we see that the engagement with uh, civic activists and civic uh, civil society organizations is not so um, uh, great. When we look at the uh, um, uh, citizens opinions of civil society organizations and their trust in civil society organizations, the picture is really very mixed. And I think uh, what surprised us is that um, there is still quite a persistent problem of the lack of visibility of uh, many civil society initiatives and civil society organizations. And this is a persistent problem and, and uh, experts as well as donors have been aware of this for some time, but this still remains to be an issue, which is now um, exacerbated by um, uh, the rising problem of closing civic space in these countries. So the fact that the uh, official discourse is trying to denigrate or delegitimize uh, quite a few civil society initiatives, it kind of um, uh, exacerbates this problem as well. Um, so our general um, uh, in conclusion here is that um, unfortunately there is still quite a persistent disconnect between uh, the society as a whole and civil society organizations, but we are really cautiously optimistic. I mean, we've put obviously apathy in the in the title to be uh, provocative and and to kind of um, uh, raise the red flags. Uh, but if uh, if I think back to the analysis on these same issues uh, some 10, 15 years ago, um, the uh, picture was much more gloomy and the disconnect was uh, uh, perfect. Was a complete uh, uh, was virtually complete. Uh, 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 with civil society organizations really existing in a sort of a bubble and then the society existing elsewhere. And this is certainly not the case anymore in uh, any Eastern partnership countries. So uh, but what we have found is that the kind of uh, success stories where civil society organizations uh, have proven to be, um, uh, have reached out to, the, to their communities, have proven to be well connected to their communities, made a difference, are well known, these are more kind of still on a case by case basis. So um, we really would like to, um, uh, on the basis of analysis, to really um, point more towards the, uh, in the direction of uh, locking in these successes and uh, upscaling these successes, trying to invest into uh, mechanisms that uh, reinforce this relationship between um, the kinds of civic activism that engages uh, broader society and, and reinforces the linkages between civic activism and broader society and the communities. Um, and here I would like to also flag a very important implication 
uh, for the problematic of the closing uh, um, space tendencies, which unfortunately um, are quite persistent even in more open and more pluralist Eastern partnership countries. And that is what we found is that the trust deficit between um, civic activists and the broader civil society um, exacerbates this problem because uh, uh, citizens tend to um, uh, mobilize less in the defense of their civic actors if they do not really know much about those civic actors, if they do not really trust those civic actors. So um, this is where I think the problem becomes uh, uh, sort of has a broader implication uh, um, that needs to be uh, uh, um, addressed. Um, as far as the attitudes to uh, uh, civic engagement on a personal level are concerned, so kind of ideas that people have about being civically uh, um, active, um, we try to look at things like, you know, would people feel that, the, that would people like to act, would people feel that this, that this is going to make any difference if they acted on any level, including on the very sort of basic daily um, uh, life issues. Um, and unfortunately, this is where uh, kind of statistically across the board, we have found that there is still quite a bit of civic apathy and disengagement. Um, but what we, I would like to particularly highlight here, something that really struck us, is that um, this uh, tendency seems to be worse, not in the countries that are kind of openly uh, repressive, as Azerbaijan obviously comes to, to one's mind, but in countries where they are actually fairly uh, open and fairly pluralistic, uh, where people uh, have seen political change, where people have mobilized on a number of occasions, but um, obviously, apparently, uh, the change was not really up to the expectation, so to say. And so what we observe in these countries is it's not just civic apathy because people don't think their action is going to change anything, but it's civic disillusionment that comes from having tried and having really failed. And uh, if, if the example that really struck us from our research is the Moldova. And, and I think this is again, something um, we didn't necessarily expect when we started looking at these issues. Um, another thing that I wanted to highlight is that we, we, we found quite a persistent negative attitudes to everything that was uh, perceived as um, remotely political. So people would try to organize around uh, more like social issues or cultural issues. And there would be uh, maybe quite, um, quite some vibrancy around those things. But people would still uh, shun away from political issues. And this is so uh, ironic, because if you look at opinion polls across all six Eastern partnership countries, you would see uh, concerns such as, for example, corruption ranking among, among top three. And uh, at the same time, though, people would not rally behind anti-corruption activists and quite to the opposite. They kind of would sort of see them as, um, as somewhat alien uh, or uh, there wouldn't be fairly ambivalent attitudes to, uh, to more politically uh, engaged civic actors. Um, and this is again, something that uh, uh, really struck us. So what we identify on, on this level is really kind of a vicious circle where this low sense of agency and lack of interest in more political issues or even dislike of more political issues uh, tend, tends to breed more civic apathy and that of course entrenches further the uh, civic uh, disengagement. So that, that's, that's, that's the kind of circle that I think needs to be um, really um, broken uh, um, and uh, sort of uh, unsettled. Um, so the, the, these are sort of very uh, uh, general, uh, uh, very uh, broad summary of, of what we, uh, Found, but there are two implications that I wanted to highlight um, a bit more uh, uh, specifically. Um, one is that uh, uh, this tendency to be uh, sort of apathetic and distrust, uh, especially this distrust institutions and, and uh, distrust institutions or um, uh, civic actors, uh, renders these societies more susceptible to conspiracy theories. For example, all the narratives about foreign agents and fifth columns and the kind of delegitimizing narratives uh, that are part of the uh, closing space techniques or uh, just part of, uh, of political debate where um, uh, you know, these narratives are used to delegitimize political opponents. Um, and people, the more people are distrustful um, uh, of each other um, and, and of institutions, the more likely they are um, to fall prey um, uh, 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 to, those, uh, to those narratives. And that of course has 
um, a very negative broader impact on the democratic public sphere on, on democratization more broadly speaking. Another um, issue here, I think, uh, uh, that stems from these tendencies is that uh, uh, the, the, the trust deficit tends to render societies more vulnerable to disinformation and manipulation. And so, um, which is a problem in itself, but it also renders societies particularly fragile in the face of um, adverse conditions, in the face of crisis. So whenever there is a political crisis, that fragility comes to the, to the fore, so to say, and the society is much more easily polarized and um, much more easily radicalized. And that is, of course, um, uh, uh, a, a problem for, for, the, for democracy or for you know, uh, reinforcing democracy. Um, but also in the face of other uh, kinds of adversity or uh, hazards, like uh, we're seeing now with the pandemic, um, uh, uh, where the, 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 social, the social links and the, um, uh, the trust uh, is lower, um, uh, these societies tend to be less resilient uh, in the face of, uh, of, this, um, uh, of this crisis. And so um, we see how uh, this gap between uh, quite vibrant civil, civic activism and the rest of the society really needs to be bridged further um, to render these societies more um, more resilient and and, uh, um, and so I'm not going to uh, uh, to go into uh, recommendations in much detail, but they all point uh, precisely in this direction that uh, how can we work further on closing the gap between uh, civic activists and the rest of the society? What are the ways of boosting civic engagement? What are the ways of rebuilding the trust uh, uh, on the societal level? Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, we think this is really also a way of uh, boosting the resilience of these societies as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katerina. Um, before I pass the floor over to our free contributors from the Eastern Partnership to comment back, I'd just like to remind the audience that you can put questions or desires to intervene in the Q&A section. We all see them. We will try to get to them as much as we can and in the best possible order and they're already starting to line up so get your questions in now I would suggest. Um, I would like next to go to Yuri Chovasov who is hopefully going to join us and is able to going to be using um, video. Yuri is, uh, are you there? Possibly not, okay. In that case I'll wait over and then I'll just hand over to you Isabella if you don't mind going next um, and hopefully Yuri will appear soon. Uh, Isabella is, uh, sure. for, is coming in from a year event so please uh, over to you. Yeah hello um, I'm very happy to see you all virtually or familiar faces and people like Lawrence who I've heard about from my colleague Mikhail Hovanishan uh, who I work together. Uh, I was also very happy to hear uh, your positive feedback about EED because I'm a country consultant for European Endowment for Democracy. So it was um, very good to hear. Uh, my paper, in fact, was focusing exactly on the issues we discussed, uh, traditional and grassroots civil society, also um, under the light of the Velvet Revolution and how different uh, groups uh, played different roles. Um, I was also looking into threats, uh, which come not only externally, but also internally, including some uh, um, conservative groups um, and how, because in many other countries, you see that often governments bake this type of groups. In, in, in case of Armenia, it's mainly former government or sometimes some other forces, not necessarily homegrown, uh, who, um, who are very much um, interfere. Uh, we also have a huge issue with media. Uh, by saying that, uh, I mean that lots of media is owned by the previous um, corrupt and authoritarian or semi-authoritarian regime. Uh, but uh, these uh, 13, 14 days of, um, I should say, war, not really even escalation. Uh, I think now it drastically changed uh, lots of things and also the composition within the civil society. It's very difficult to judge now, very difficult to come up with any um, 
you know, statements uh, because the process still goes on. Uh, but a few points I wanted to share with you. Of course, you should take my bias into account. Uh, I'm trying to be as impartial as I can in this situation. Um, but still, I think uh, first thing I wanted to say uh, that there is very strong uh, frustration. Uh, within the very broad civil society of Armenia, but that formal groups, informal groups, just citizens, uh, because uh, people were expected, maybe naively, that there will be more support and more reaction uh, from the European Union and the United States. Um, of course, we all understand that it's, um, it's a real world, uh, but still, lots of people um, in civil society have this huge uh, disappointment. Uh, of course, statements are good, and um, we hear a lot uh, of statements also coming from the Minsk group, from, um, from EU, elsewhere. Uh, but this situation is very tense, and uh, we don't have any numbers from Azerbaijan. But in Armenia, we have, as of today, 500 and 36, I think, uh, killed in action, and all of them are young boys, 18 to 20 years old, I think 90% of them. So we, we have this uh, strong frustration uh, within the civil society. I think second uh, point I wanted to mention is democracy. And uh, I think I hear a lot of conversation that we're also punished uh, for the revolution and punished to become a democratic country and uh, there were other precedents in other places. So whether your democracy or your strive for democracy, or at least you have electoral democracy, uh, and then there is a strong authoritarian rich state, you are still um, have no, no support, let's put it that way. So the world still is, is run by interests and uh, strong powers. This is another issue that I feel uh, very strong um, within, within the civil society debate. And third point I wanted to make, um, uh, now we have some peace voices, uh, both in Armenia and Azerbaijan, and most of them are rather individual or leftist groups. Uh, there was a statement by seven leftist Azerbaijani, and today is a statement by four Armenian uh, leftists uh, calling for peace. Of course, they are just individuals as well, while traditional civil society, uh, especially in Azerbaijan, uh, took this very hard line of position uh, supporting the um, Aliyev's uh, offense against Armenia. And this is very disappointing also for people like me who have been in peace building process for the last 20 years and uh, lots of bridges and uh, lots of personal relations we built over the years. Um, are, we are getting through difficult times. Um, so I, I come back to my main point of my paper, uh, also under the light of this uh, war, uh, that conservative groups are um, becoming stronger, um, also because of their hardline position against uh, Azerbaijan and pro-democracy groups are weakening. Uh, also because the democratic transition from war perspective or peace perspective um, is more vulnerable as a moment. And this fragile democracy that we achieved is very much under threat, is, is ve very much. Also because we have martial law now, we have total censorship on publications uh, and opinions. Uh, it's very harsh um, and that's understandable taking into account the whole situation. Um, and also the, the government didn't manage uh, judicial reform, lots of it. So we all expect that these hardliners and uh, conservative groups might have more backup um, when, we don't know when, but at least when the ceasefire will be achieved or if uh, we even don't know how these groups will affect the whole negotiation uh, process. So I won't get into the details of the conflict um, I'd be happy to answer your questions. I don't want really to jeopardize the space, uh, but these points I really wanted to make a bold, especially democracy and conflict and this constellation and how conflicts can destroy democracies and how fragile democracies are in this world order. And uh, also how, to me, 
um, how dangerous messages uh, this type of situation sends to other uh, to other people who strive for democracy and, and liberty, including Belarus. Uh, so I, I probably stop here and I'd be happy to answer uh, your questions. Thank you very much, Isabella. Um, very important perspectives that you give us. And of course, they do connect actually to what is going on on the ground when there are no conflicts, either live or dormant. Uh, we really appreciate that you are in these difficult circumstances able to be with us and we certainly have no i i appreciate you know. uh, your invitation just by last thing um, a quote from my colleague uh, who is younger like 10 12 years younger than i am we had this difficult conversations i was saying look we live in this real politics world we shouldn't have very high expectations and she said you know i live in it's the partnership era so i had more hope uh, i just wanted to share it with you as um uh, heartwarming uh, quote, maybe from a younger generation. Thank you very much, Isabella. You mentioned at the end that Belarus. So I think we will try again to have Yuri Chabosov uh, from Minsk, uh, hopefully only on audio. Well, unfortunately, only on audio. Yuri, are you there? Uh, hi. 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 I'm here. <laughs> Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, congratulations uh, for this uh, new uh, policy papers. It's a great. Uh, job is great research uh, and the Belarus it's a nice place now to talk about uh, uh, civil society and uh, about uh, civil sector new civic actors uh, but it's not good place for um, um, online uh, co conversations uh, maybe uh, so many zoom uh, zoom groups uh, discussing now inter international approach on Belarus uh, but now, if you're coming to the streets in uh, Belarus, uh, you, uh, you see the civil society, you see the new civic actors, and uh, mm, you can feel in the air the uh, uh, new uh, approach of people to civil society itself. You can see CSO activists, you can see people from different uh, levels of organization, from old CSO, from new civic groups, uh, people from uh, trade union, uh, but also workers from uh, big uh, um, uh, state uh, owners, uh, uh, big industrious plants. Uh, it's no gap between um, people from old CSO and people from new initiatives, people who just coming to the uh, civil activity. Uh, it's no, no any, uh, um, not any gap and not any um, confrontation between old uh, activists and new. Uh, of course, uh, there are a uh, lot of discussions about the uh, tactics, about uh, how you should use this new uh, situation, but mo majority of this uh, discussion is uh, between uh, uh, leaders in internet, between the bloggers, between opinion makers. People on the street are united uh, as, uh, uh, as one actor, as one civil, united as one civil uh, force. And uh, uh, what, what unite uh, these people? What is the factor who is, uh, unites these people in one force? If you ask them, uh, the answer will be dignity. It's uh, not geopolitical choice. It's not uh, issues about pro-Russians or uh, um, pro-Western uh, activists. It's a question of uh, uh, people's dignity. And uh, if you... Uh, Mm, if you ask me what is the tool who make this uh, new uh, civil actor united, the tool will be, the answer will be this new tool, it's uh, communications. New tool of communications, a new, uh, mm, a new system of communication from people to people uh, without any uh, media, without any uh, editors or uh, even without any um, intermediary um, systems. Uh, Telegram is, of course, the main uh, main tool in this uh, revolution. Uh, and uh, uh, let me jump to uh, the um, question of the duality between old CSO and new civic actors, between uh, formalized civil society organizations and uh, uh, informal grassroots groups. Uh, of course, in Belarus, the uh, environment for both these uh, worlds uh, was um, uh, not very good. Uh, of course, we have um, 
repressions against human rights uh, organizations. We have uh, legal uh, bad legislation about registration, ban of uh, activity for unregistered organizations, and of course political pressures both to formal groups and informal initiative so was very uh, strong from the government. Uh, Belarus is not a democratic country, of course. Uh, in the same time, uh, the uh, business community uh, uh, exists in the environment uh, much better than CSO. It was completely free to people to create new business uh, entity. It, and even some civil society groups um, make the choice uh, which institutional form uh, should be registered for us? Uh, civil society organizations, or it's better to exist as commercial organization. And they registered as commercial organization because it's more freedom for such entity in Belarus. Uh, IT sector, it's, of course, it's a, um, uh, IT sector is uh, uh, one of the main uh resources for uh, new this uh, civil uh, society mobilization even um uh, even uh, uh, innovations coming not from a uh, system of cso but from uh, it sector and business community for example it uh, the biggest crowdfunding platform uh, in belarus was created not by a uh, civil society sector but from they coming from uh, business community. The the name of this uh, crowdfunding platform is Mola Mola, and they come from the environment of uh, this uh, new um, opposition uh, of uh, 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 Mr. Victor Babarika, who was uh, uh, one of the candidates in this presidential election, and the creator of this uh, new uh, crowdfunding platform, biggest crowdfunding platform, it was a son of uh, Mr. Babarika. So, um, what is the trigger? What is the trigger who make uh, the, uh, this new civic uh, resources and old CSO and old activists work together? The trigger was, of course, uh, in Belarus it's completely clear, uh, the trigger was a coronavirus, and this uh, was a trigger to mo civil mobilizations. Uh, it's a COVID uh, challenge, and the answer of government to the COVID uh, challenge, it's a, a trigger who make the civil society not uh, sleeping and bored CSO, but active and uh, uh, mobilizing civil society. Uh, the answer from the state was insufficient, and it was completely um, ignored to the people, uh, uh, people uh, questions. And the answer from CSO, answer from uh, IT community, answer from people in the internet, bloggers, opinion makers, what clear was uh, very, um, uh, very effective and good looking for the people. And the answers uh, show uh, the state, it, the dictator state, tyranny, not effective to answer to this uh, life issue challenges. And the answer from civil society, from new society, from IT community was effective, was good, it was good for the people. Uh, so the trigger was COVID. The linkage between uh, the people, it's new communication tools. Uh, first of all, it's Telegram, but also another system of uh, communications. And the answer was the synergy, synergy with the, between old CSO, synergy between crowdfunding platforms, uh, activists, local communities, uh, now, if you come into the block in Minsk, it's a big city, but in the blocks you can see it each evening, some local uh, groups who just drink tea and discussing what will be in new rally in the Sunday, what we should do on this run rally. So it's not uh, inspired by CSO or political groups, it's inspired by local groups of people for the people. So it's democracy. And now it's the, these groups ask, ask to CSO, about, uh, of course, educational activity, uh, because uh, they uh, need information about very simple things, about democracy, about constitution. Now Lukashenko say, let's discussing about constitution, so it's a CSO, it's think tanks or human rights activists who can say to the people, we need in constitution something about legislation, something about human rights, something about another important things who make the state not tyranny, but democratic state and 
it's what you need, what you need for the uh, normal uh, normal life. Uh, so it's uh, 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 this uh, um, uh, this request for from the people. It's very clear in Belarus because now uh, even all the very uh, wise men, very old experts say about uh, something what they say uh, long years ago, and this what uh, this go to the new. Uh, audience, new audience who ask this old information about uh, very simple things about democracy, uh, check and balance system of the government, etc., etc. Et but hu human rights included, of course. Uh, it's very hard to say. I'm going to the final of my very <laughs> emotional, maybe um, emotional speech. It's it's hard to say what will be the outcome of this uh, new explosion of uh, civil society, new uh, mobilization of civil society. Uh, even in the terms of, um, even in terminal, terminology, it's not clear about what is this. Uh, somebody say it's a protest, but somebody say it's a revolution. And of course, it's a state propaganda who say it's, uh, of course, it's a colorful revolution. It's a plot organized uh, from abroad, from Western, from Eastern, uh, not from uh, North, uh, maybe, but also from North, because it's Lithuania who now it's a, a new enemy for uh, uh, for Belarusian governments, but uh, mm, this uh, propaganda uh, it's uh, it's a trick from propaganda uh, because if you ask who is this foreign agents who is this responsible from the abroad uh, to this plot it's the people with Belarusian names it's people who go abroad uh, who are in exile it's a human rights group it's a political groups it's a media who broadcasted from uh, abroad so it's an issue it's a very important issue I, I think we talk a lot uh, about um, uh, CSO who looks uh, better jurisdictions in in abroad in in Belarus uh, the activity of uh, this group it's very very clear the impact of this group is very is very clear and uh, of course it's no geopolitical choice it's no uh, choice between uh, Russia and uh, Brussels but it's a choice about um, about values it's a choice about tyranny and about uh, freedom and uh, look uh, people who standards in governments european standards in uh, uh, way of life uh, and the choice from the russia uh, it's a choice for tyranny uh, we have not so many meetings or really pro Lukashenko in Minsk because it's uh, it's not uh, trendy <laughs> in Minsk now. But some groups uh, coming to the street with uh, uh, pro Lukashenko motos, and these groups usually it's pro Russian activists. Very small groups inspired, clearly inspired by uh, Russian government because they recognize itself as a part of Russian movements, uh, not and another. Uh, extremist groups now it's uh, completely free in Minsk they come they coming to the street nobody beat these small meetings uh, Omon not uh, beat this um, uh, gathering these groups it's co it's completely pro-russian groups and they support Lukashenko now but I, uh, can I, yeah. I think we need to move on a little bit in view of time uh, can I pass mm -hmm. uh, let you pass on now to Katerina in Kiev and if you don't if you're ready Katerina whenever you're good Yes, sure. Uh, thank you, Nicholas, and uh, good morning or good evening, wherever you are, uh, dear colleagues. I would like also to uh, thank you very much for engaging me in this project. It was indeed very interesting to work on, uh, and it actually spurred on my work uh, about the and inspired my further work uh, on the issue of uh, societal attitudes to civil society. So after uh, we had uh, our last discussion in Kyiv uh, almost exactly a year ago, I continued to work and I would also like to maybe present some further thoughts on the civil uh, society, uh, on the societal attitudes towards civil society. Um, I'm looking also look, very much looking forward to uh, reading the papers. Thank you very much for sharing them and congratulations on this uh, undoubtedly great work. Um, Katarina Pishikova um, already mentioned the challenge of measurements of uh, participation and trust towards civil society, and this is undoubtedly so. 
Um, I also struggled with this issue. Basically, when we speak about societal attitudes towards civil society, where does uh, society end and civil society starts, right? Do we, when we say civil society, is it just the whole society or is it just uh, uh, some organized groups? Then how, which organized groups belong to civil society and which don't? Um, do we only, uh, for example, um, count into civil society the uh, groups uh, which are uh, in this or that way connected to policy, uh, but how about such organizations as house committees or parent committees? Of course, these are all theoretical debates which have been going on for decades, but they are very important for uh, the region of Eastern partnership because I think that we are used to some uh, standard measuring. And although in Ukraine there are various pollsters which measure uh, public attitudes uh, very in depth, still they are lacking some nuances. Uh, one nuance which is not there is the um, grassroots, uh, which have been mentioned already. So how do we define grassroots? How do we pinpoint them? How do we then count who participates in them and who trusts them even more? So this is a big challenge, uh, all those kind of informal organizations. Um, this is very important both in terms of the donor support, also in terms of the more formal assessment of whether a civil society in uh, the Eastern Partnership and in Ukraine is particular is weak or strong. Uh, just one example, which I would like to give you. Um, I recently researched uh, attitudes towards European integration in the Donbass. So the Donbass is the east of Ukraine, a conflict-torn region, the Donetsk and Lugansk oblast. And I was surprised to find out that you can hardly find a residential uh, residential area in that region, either at city or town or even small village, which would be devoid of an um, civil society organization of a kind. Um, I'm not sure how it translates into real figures, you know, civil society organization per a million or a thousand of inhabitants. But the fact is that there are really very, there is very vibrant grassroots movement there. And this is just one example, which maybe uh, is not captured by the polls. And more importantly, if we measure how many people participate uh, formally or informally in the work of these organizations, this may be a fraction, but this fraction may be very important in bringing about change when it comes to change. Um, I was also wondering about when we, think, when we talk about participation, okay, there are formal NGOs and there are broader CSOs, okay. Um, but how about individual participation? For example, you might say, well, in order to, for civil society to be civil society, there should be a group of any kind. But how about, for example, single pickets in Russia? Russia doesn't belong to Eastern Partners, but just something, something to think about. Even an individual can make a difference. So do we also count individuals? And if yes, then again, how do we measure participation and trust, for example, a trust to an individual? Uh, in one of the um, polls which you quote in your uh, papers and which I also used for my work is the uh, Engage Civic Engagement Poll, Engage the project by USAID uh, implemented in Ukraine. It actually attempted to measure trust towards individual activists. And as one of my colleagues said, um, trust towards individual activists is lower uh, then to civil society organizations. Uh, one of the reasons for that was that people were suspicious uh, that these people simply uh, try to advance their careers, maybe actually even to pursue political careers. So uh, all I want to say is that this is a very tricky distinction, again, of what is civil society, how do we then measure and assess it. Um, to maybe conclude, because I know that we are running out of time, I would just like to say that when you speak about uh, these two qualities, these two indicators of participation and trust in civil society, um, we should be wary that when we have this formula, which I actually myself used in, in the paper, which I submitted for this project, that the uh, level of trust is relatively high, level of participation is relatively low. When we use it, we should be very cautious. Speak, when we speak, um, uh, when we have to then make clear which fraction of civil society we talk about. Because yes, uh, trust or civil society represented by the volunteers, uh, and it is another, another actually completely different debate, who is meant by volunteers in Ukraine? This definition may be different, for example, in the US and in Ukraine. So yes, trust towards volunteers has plummeted since 2014. But if we look at the trust towards CSOs, whatever the respondent means when answering this question to the pollster, um, then the growth is not so, so big, so high, if at all. Um, 
so when we speak about participation, trust and other and functions and other attitudes to our civil society, we should always bear in mind which civil society are we talking about? NGOs, grassroots, some amorphous hybrid individuals which get together when needed and then collapse when the need is over. Uh, this is very important for our um, scientific and uh, scholastic and, and policy uh, research, uh, especially in terms of providing recommendations. Thank you very much, Katerina. Um, that's great. We have uh, some time left for questions and answers. Um, I will pick from what our, our audience has submitted and somewhat paraphrase um, just to give some warnings uh, to the different panelists because a couple of questions that are personally directed. Um, so first of all, we have a question from uh, Johannes Alfeld for Katarina Pishtikova in particular, and that relates to whether you think that any sort of improvement in the standing of NGOs and civic activism is connected to rising standard of living issues. Um, to Rosa Balfour, we have a question from Susan Stewart, uh, which is connected inevitably, I think, to the question of a geopolitical commission in terms of like, how does that relate to the issue of taking the geopolitics out of some of these uh, mobilization moments in these in different countries where some of them have been in the past more geopolitically connected and some haven't. Um, we have a question from Soren Yonita and we'll, I will condense the point a little bit to probably more to you Lawrence which is the point how do we overcome I think the impression that certainly some civic activists or some of the more uh, activists or grassroots or possibly radical uh, organizations or movements in the Eastern Partnership still have the sense that maybe they are seen more as an irritant than uh, a contributor by the EU. I mean, whether that's a factual statement or not, I'm, it's, it's for you to challenge, I'm sure. But I think the fact that there is that impression is something that maybe the EU and possibly also actually the USA at some point needs to address that uh, actors that are new and possibly unconventional see themselves by donors and by uh, international aid actors as irritants as much as contributors to the um, societal um, situation in their countries. And then I think after those three statements, I will actually ask our three participants uh, from um, the Eastern Partnerships, assuming that their tech uh, on the URIS side is still working. A question from uh, Christopher Russell, I think I believe in Washington, which is to say, uh, what actually would you say is the benefit to the EU and to the US, to the EU and um, US citizens of a stronger, healthier civil society in your countries, what would be your message back to, to put it bluntly, the taxpayer or the, the voter in the EU and in the US in terms of why that should be something that should be supported by their institutions? So uh, maybe I'll start with you, Katerina Pishikova, about the question about the standing of civil society and uh, standard uh, standing of civil society and the standard of living going up in different countries. Whoa! Um, well, I could take it could take me like um, a, a, you know a lecture or even a couple of lectures to uh, to address that. There's certainly a scholarship since the especially since the 1980s that looks at the linkage between um, social attitudes and the socioeconomic conditions. And uh, you know the World Value Service is is a wonderful data set where you could go and look at those things. So there's certainly um, a connection. I'm not sure the standard of living has been uh, steadily rising for six Eastern partnership countries. And this is another reason why uh, I'm not sure we could sort of uh, just uh, extrapolate and generate, uh, generalize for all six countries uh, on this spot because they have actually faced quite a number of uh, really dramatic crises. Um, it's true that for some of these countries, 1990s were really traumatic that, uh, from the point of view of socioeconomic situation, but it's also true that, for example, Belarus never really had the bad 1990s, right? Uh, um, so uh, the, 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 the situation with the rising or not standard of living in the six Eastern partnership countries is actually more complex than it might um, look, but I would like to highlight um, a couple of other factors which I think did contribute um, to some of the changes that we describe or some of the changes that um, came up uh, in, in other uh, people's presentations today. And one is, again, um, uh, we have to give credit to, uh, to the donor community that has become uh, much more sophisticated in, uh, in their approach to supporting civil society. 
um, and in moving, uh, uh, making quite an effort um, at moving uh, beyond sort of a very, very standard uh, one size fits all uh, templates that were initially applied in 1990s. And so there was this kind of mutually reinforcing mechanism, I think, in civil societies in Eastern partnership, whereby the civil societies have evolved organically, just as they, any society would evolve. Uh, but then there was also more push from, from external actors to, um, to encourage them to, to uh, look, work more in coalitions, to work more on the um, outreach. Um, uh, the, the gap between cap the capital and the rural areas persists, but it's not it's nowhere close to how it was in the 1990s or early 2000s. So there's, there's lots of progress and this is, the civil society is, um, have become more diverse and more sophisticated, uh, partially because this uh, interaction with, uh, with the donors has evolved and partially because the expectations of, of civic activists who are involved and of the society have evolved as well. So uh, um, I think this is one thing uh, to keep in mind if we look at the kind of uh, the evolution of the issue. And another thing is, of course, the generational change. Um, and so people who talked about very weak civil societies in, uh, in Eastern Europe in the early 90s um, uh, were actually uh, always adding this, uh, this footnote in the end saying, well, let's see what happens when, when the generational uh, change um, occurs. And it did occur, and, and we do see uh, quite some um, uh, significant uh, differences between the generations, both in terms of attitudes more generally and in terms of um, uh, civic engagement. So uh, these are some, some of the key, I think, factors that I wanted to highlight, but this is, of course, an extremely um, complex um, issue that has lots of dimensions to it. Thank you, Katarina. Um, Lawrence, if I can come to you now, and possibly then afterwards, maybe Margot, you might want to jump in on the back of this, because I think this is a donor related possibly question about this question of perception that we see in the region of the more grassroots or new actors um, being seen sometimes by donor institutions as irritants. And more generally, I think I will give you a chance also to maybe then comment on what you've heard so far. So maybe Lawrence first. Yeah, you need to unmute Lawrence. Quite so, no, you see, um, definitely a generational challenge. Um, the, uh, no, listen, thanks very much to all for the very thought provoking discussion. I mean, uh, let me come at it from this angle. Uh, this is definitely a geopolitical commission. Um, why is supporting civil society in the interests of European Union taxpayers? Uh, because it's a core value of the European Union and it's been one of the founding principles is to stand up for rule of law, democracy, freedom of expression. And that is very much what civil society is all about. And um, now let's clarify what we're talking about. I think the European Union, like any other, I, by the way, don't like the phrase donor organization. I think that's exactly what we're, that's only one aspect of what we do because we're a political organization uh, and we stand up for our values. Now, supporting the principle of freedom of expression doesn't mean we agree with everybody who expresses an opinion. It means that we stand up for the principle of freedom of expression. So um, we, we believe that it's very important that civil society has the space to speak up, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to agree with every single individual organization or individual expressing a view. Um, and I think that is an important difference because we have to see where the European Union can be most effective and it's always work in progress. But I tried to set out five reasons why we think we're making progress in that direction. I won't repeat them all, uh, but I think that working through partner organizations and trying to reach the, I mean, we will not reach uh, all aspects of grassroots directly. It's not our role, but that doesn't mean we don't want to help. So we're, we're constantly looking at our role and how we can interact. What we do do, however, is strongly defend the role of civil society in helping shape societies across the Eastern Partnership. And I think that is the role of the European Union. We raise it systematically in bilateral and multilateral fora. Uh, and we listen very carefully in debates like this as to what, how, what we could be doing differently to be even more effective. So um, time probably doesn't allow me to do an even more robust thing, but I agree with all those who say it's about public trust. And clearly the social media uh, has transformed the landscape completely. So I think, you know, whether you're a vlogger uh, or a well-established civil society organization, 
we believe on the side of the European Union, there needs to be space uh, to operate. And uh, we passionately believe in the watchdog role. And I saw some comments on the chat about, you know, yeah, it's more comfortable if we work with certain other, I don't agree with that. I think we've always stood up for all types of civil society organizations and we need to engage with lots of different aspects of civil society. So of course others are entitled to disagree, but I would say that robustly that the European Union is on the side of creating more space for civil society. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Margaret, do you want to jump in on the back of that? Well, sure. I think um, for us, we're constantly learning. And I think this conversation today has helped inform our, our views. And we realize there, there are things that we do well, things that we can do better. Uh, some of the takeaways from this conversation is that we need to continue to widen our aperture about the types of organization whom we support. Um, and the, I think there are important points on support for rural, uh, organizations operating in rural areas, micro organizations, individuals, focusing on the value of non-political issues and community level efforts, and then exploiting what Yuri was talking about, the nexus between business and civil society as agents for change. So I think, um, I think we need to uh, be flexible. We need to uh, basically look to the countries in which we're operating to, uh, to give us the signals of where these openings are, 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 are currently exist and then to try to exploit these openings and work in partnership with the Eastern Partnership countries. Thank you, Margot. Uh, Rosa, can I ask you to be a very, very short answer on the connection to what you were saying about uh, taking the geopolitics out of the civil society mobilization sometimes and the notion of a geopolitical commission? And I know it's impossible to do in a very short sentence, but I do want that to give time to our free uh, regional partners to actually maybe wrap it up. Oh, I don't know how free I can be, but yeah, immediately after 9th of August, the, you know, the leaders, of the, of the protest that the candidates um, said, we, this is for us, this is not a, a choice about geopolitics. And immediately, and it was you know, a few days after there was this big webinar with Ursula von der Leyen and Charles Michel, both of them underlined to, that they were saying, we support what the people of Belarus want. We don't want to uh, you know, rob them from Russia. It was a message to Russia because they were terrified that of a second Ukraine 2014 event and annexation of Crimea. So that was why, because they were afraid of what are, that is geopolitics, that is the realist um, attitude towards international politics that the Kremlin is pursuing. The EU embracing, the commission embracing this idea of geopolitical commission is setting itself to be subject to criticism because it's a bit of a contradiction in terms, in the sense that the EU, by definition, the way it's been built, the way it has evolved, is actually to go against power politics, to diffuse power politics and foster cooperation. So it's kind of not in the DNA of the EU, but this is the world we live in. So in a sense, the Commission is, you know, making a, a statement which, which makes, lends itself to being criticized, but it's recognizing the reality. So the challenge really for the EU is to marry these components. And I think when you look at civil society support or human rights support, all the work that I've done, the first thing that is so obvious is that diplomacy doesn't always back all the efforts carried out to support civil society and human rights. And I think, I think what the EU has done in Belarus is pretty good. It's what the EU could have done. You know, the leverage of the EU on Lukashenko is minimal. But has the EU done enough vis-a-vis -vis Russia? And I think here we can, you know, that would be, we would have to have another webinar. But, the, you know, if the EU wants to protect that free space from geopolitical interference, it needs to persuade or to uh, impose on Russia um, a limit to its own interference in managing this transition post-9th of August. And I hope there will be a transition, 
And the EU will have to be very firm on making sure that that transition is not orchestrated from Moscow via Lukashenko. It needs to be something else. And that's perhaps where a bit of more of a hard-nosed uh, policy is needed. Thank you, Rosa. Um, we have about a few minutes that we can go over. So I will give maybe the floor back to, in this order, Katarina in Kiev, and then Isabella in Yerevan, and then finally, hopefully, Yuri has got um, his connection is good enough. Uh, final brief reactions from you, Katarina, Isabella, and Yuri, in what you've heard today. And I would maybe like to address the question from the audience about the necessity to support civil society uh, from the EU and US taxpayers. And uh, I would just like to give a brief example. Uh, the, uh, I already talked today about the Donbass region. So currently it's uh, divided into the government controlled area and non-government controlled area. What you can see in government controlled area is the uh, drastic change maybe not so much obvious in terms of infrastructure and uh, visual, um, you know, visual elements, uh, but even in them too. Uh, but on the one hand, in terms of uh, civic awareness, in terms of national awareness, in terms of uh, uh, civil society landscape, I've talked about that. Uh, and uh, this has been um, possible thanks to, in my opinion, uh, to two uh, factors. One is the uh, conflict with Russia, which uh, spurred the uh, self-awareness in various terms and uh, civic activism among the local population. Uh, because these activities which I've mentioned, they are very often administered by IDPs who moved from the conflict area to the uh, conflict-free area. But second is the donor support. Uh, I would love uh, Ukraine to be the country which not only receives, but also shares and shares much more. Despite the fact that you've criticized the term donor today, uh, I use it in a very neutral sense and I would love Ukraine to be donor for civil societies around the world. Until this is not the case, uh, this donor support uh, has been able to make a huge difference uh, in such area where, which was actually blamed for poor civic activism just some seven and more years ago. So this is just one illustration. Thank you, Katharina. Hey, Isabella, what about you? Um, I try to stay positive. Um, though maybe some 15 days ago, I would say that supporting civil society also supports um, accountability that um, the, the, the governments have. And then it also leads to more peace and security in the region. Now, I doubt that um, exactly due to the reasons um, I try to um, highlight. Uh, but on positive note, I believe also thanks to Easter partnership format, uh, we've got a lot of solidarity. I think there was a lot of solidarity from Armenian civil society towards the Belarus and uh, Belarusian citizens uh, over the, before the war. Uh, and I think it's, it's still something that we feel from our colleagues that even if at the state level, we don't see much support, uh, due to many reasons, but on civil society level, there is an important uh, human network um, that we have. For example, we are going to have some um, Ukrainian colleagues uh, to help us in fact-finding missions um, or other, uh, other support that we see within this larger and broader uh, Easter partnership format. Uh, so I hope for the best and for ceasefire to last and then uh, we can participate uh, in, in, indeed in civil society um, debates. But for the future, I think this issue of civil society, peace, security, democracy versus uh, peace and conflict, I think it should be highlighted because Armenia, Azerbaijan are not the only ones. We have obviously Ukraine and Georgia on board with the same issues. Or, of course, all of them are different, but the conflict is something that's indeed uh, dooms lots of um, efforts. Thank you. Uh, and thanks so much for having me um, today and just part of this project as well. Thank you, Isabella. Uh, Yuri, are you able to come in now? Um, uh, no, oh, yes, we have you. Okay, Yuri, final uh, words from uh, Minsk. Uh, the, uh, the answer in this uh, question is very simple. The democratic world order is safer than the world when tyranny competes uh, one each other. It's a question not only about the war, but also about the world challenges, because uh, 
uh, COVID uh, show us uh, what it's important to have democratic world order and uh, possibility to create a uh, joint answer to the life question in the world scale. And uh, in Belarus, we, uh, you see uh, Lithuania support democracy in Belarus because Lukashenko built Russian nuclear plant in the a uh, few kilometers from um, Lithuania capitals, not in the on other place, but uh, with the uh, border to the Lithuania. So democracy safe, undemocratic regime. It's a tyranny and unpredictable tyranny. Well, I think that's a very good way to end. I think this conversation. Um, thank you very, very much to all our participants and to our audience. Uh, I feel that we could certainly have gone on for much longer, but I think everybody also has busy lives to go back to, or evenings in some cases. Uh, again, thank you very much to all of you, but, uh, all our participants. Uh, thanks in particular to our friends at uh, USAID and Digineer for pro supporting this project. And of course, also a large thanks to my colleague, John, John Alexander in Washington, who managed to keep this uh, ship floating until the end. So I look forward to seeing you, all of you in future projects, future webinars, and possibly even future in person at some point when it's possible to travel and meet people. Until then, have a good day or have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thanks. So